You're listening to the Baha'i World News Service. In this episode, Professor Mina Yazdani explores the profound contributions of the Baha'i community in Iran to various aspects of the country's development, including health, agriculture, and education. She describes how a community, despite relentless persecution, has embodied the Baha'i principle of constructive resilience, persisting in its efforts to serve the needs of their society since its inception in the mid-19th century. From the Baha'i World News Service, this is Insights from the Field, a podcast series that explores experiences from Baha'i efforts to contribute to social progress from the grassroots to the international level. Professor Yazdani begins by describing two distinct ways the Baha'i community has been contributing to Iran's development. One way has been indirect, through the example set by living according to Baha'i principles in both private and public life. The other, through direct contributions to Iranian society in diverse fields. When we discuss the contributions that uh, the Baha'is of Iran made to the progress and development of that country, we can think of two ways of their influence, one direct and one indirect. For example, the equality of men and women as a Baha'i principle was practiced by uh, believers, both in their uh, private familial life and in social arena and administrative arena. And I believe that this would definitely uh, have an influence in, in a larger community. But speaking of the direct effect of uh, Baha'is in the development and progress of Iran, there are many areas that we can consider. Many of these areas have been um, researched uh, extensively, education, health, medicine, um, uh, industry, agriculture. Professor Yazdani shares insights from prominent Iranian historian Jeanette Afari about the period of Iran's constitutional revolution, which took place early in the 20th century. During this time, when democratic processes were largely unknown in Iranian society, the Baha'i community was learning about collective decision-making through consultation and election of local governing Baha'i institutions, a process distinctive for its lack of nominations in campaigning. So, Jeanette Afari, uh, one of the foremost historians of Iran, talks about how the Baha'i community had an influence on uh, the basically context in which the uh, constitutional revolution happened. She tells us that at the turn of the 20th century, the population of Iran was uh, something around 10 million. And then uh, she gives us an estimate of the population of the Baha'i community, and she says it was, it was something between 50,000 to 100,000. And then she adds that what happened in this community had an influence outside, and uh, amongst the things that she mentions in the Baha'i community was, for example, this uh, attention and emphasis on the whole process of consultation or the fact that Baha'is, she, she says that at that time in late 19th century, they had basically very early uh, version of what we call now Baha'i uh, local assemblies or national assemblies that are the elected uh, bodies that run the affairs of, of the community. And what I want to add to what Dr. Afari says is that, well, in addition to that, um, um, emphasis on consultation. We know that very soon, uh, Baha'is in every part of Iran started voting, electing, meaning deciding about the leadership of their community. That, of course, would have an effect on the larger community in terms of exposing them to this idea that you, as a member of a community, have the right to choose 
who to serve the larger community. Uh, and uh, so you, uh, in effect, uh, has a role in deciding how the community is going to run. Professor Yazdani discusses the early efforts of the Baha'is of Iran in agriculture, drawing inspiration from the Baha'i teachings, which emphasize the role of the farmer as the first active agent in human society. Abdul Baha very clearly wanted the Baha'is of Iran to do their best for the betterment of the country in every aspect. Then he even um, mentions education, health, medicine, sciences, agriculture, industry, do your best to develop Iran, to do your best for the progress of Iran in all of these areas. I even uh, remember having read a tablet, a letter from Abdul Baha to the Baha'is in the north of Iran, advising them to start cultivating tea and uh, telling them in this way, Iran won't need importing tea anymore if you start cultivating tea. things. Instructions even at that level for uh, the development of agriculture. And we know that farming agriculture has been um, emphasized even in the tablet of uh, tablets of Baha'u'llah himself that uh, he mentions clearly that in, in the 19th century, late 19th century, he's talking about the uh, issues pertaining to agriculture has been kind of ignored in Iran and they have to be paid more attention to. So Baha'is, wherever uh, they could, they were also doing their best in this uh, uh, regard as well. While significant contributions to agriculture were made, Baha'i's efforts to improve Iranian society extended to many other areas as well. Professor Yazdani next discusses the community's pioneering work in public health and hygiene. Baha'is started very early on in Iran uh, to apply Baha'i teachings uh, to the uh, social surroundings in which they were living. For example, the first uh, bath, uh, bath house with a shower uh, was built by Baha'is in uh, Abade, a small town in uh, the province of Fars near Shiraz. And uh, it was a Baha'i physician who built this um, bathhouse with a shower and he was very much encouraged by Abdul Baha. And the background, a necessary background to mention here is that in Iran at the time, the bathhouses were basically uh, the sources of infection and disease because they were pools or basins that uh, people would go in and would wash themselves. And uh, the water would not be changed frequently, sometimes just in, uh, three uh, to four times per year. So you can imagine how uh, foul smelling and how infected that water was. So Baha'u'llah forbids uh, his believers from entering those uh, pools uh, of uh, bathhouses in Iran. So Baha'is were ready to apply this teaching to make a different type of um, bathhouse and that's how they introduced showers. And very soon in other parts of Iran also, Baha'is made the same thing. I should also add here that um, not only it was for the application of uh, Baha'u'llah's teachings that they did it, but also in some parts of Iran, uh, Muslims uh, sometimes didn't allow Baha'is to enter their uh, bathhouses. And the important point is that Baha'i bathhouses were open to all. Whatever initiative they managed to do was basically for the public uh, benefit. They didn't limit it to uh, Baha'is. So if Muslims uh, wanted to enter Baha'i bathhouses, they were more than uh, welcome. A related issue with regards to hygiene is, of course, medicine and uh, the uh, hospitals that uh, Baha'is built in Iran. The first hospital, the Hospital of Sehat, was uh, built in early 20th century. The three Baha'i physicians that started uh, um, and first began thinking about uh, the establishment of the hospital were in touch with Abdul Baha. 
and um, it's in 1908, 1909, uh, they are uh, thinking about it. And the mission statement uh, with which they begin the hospital is obviously based on their communications uh, with Abdul Baha. And actually, two Baha'i scholars, uh, Sina Fazel and Minu Fadi, uh, have included a translation of the main points of uh, this mission statement. And if it is possible, uh, for me to uh, just share it with you and may I have a copy of the book. Thank you very much. The statement went as follows. Service to mankind regardless of race, religion, and nationality. The dignity and respect of patients should be of paramount importance. To serve mainly the poor and those who due to poverty cannot afford medical treatment to assist physicians in Tehran and surrounding areas if they are having diagnostic difficulties. Hospital staff must aim to use the best medical treatment available at the time and to consult colleagues in the West for advice and direction. Then they also uh, invited Baha'i female physicians like Dr. Susan Moody to join them and they provided service for everybody. So the hospital ran successfully for some time and it was working uh, up to the uh, middle of uh, 1920s. Then the second hosp hospital that I would like to mention was built later on in the middle of the 20th century uh, by Abdul Misaq Misaqiyeh in uh, 1948. Uh, he built this um, hospital of Misaqiyeh. Again, it was a non-profit organization. It provided service to the poor for free. And uh, it also um, very soon developed a, a nursing school and also a nursing uh, home. And actually they also, uh, they, they, they had two uh, levels of nursing school. One was the higher level that um, gave uh, students a bachelor degree and uh, another uh, lower, more practical uh, level that provided the uh, graduates uh, with uh, an associate degree. And uh, it, it was a very successful uh, hospital. Like the uh, hospital of Sehat, um, for some time people hesitated to go to this hospital of the Baha'is, but then uh, that changed and people were uh, benefiting from it, especially the poor. And the level of the medical um, services that were um, rendered in that hospital was of the highest possible uh, in the country. Sadly, uh, after the 1979 revolution, it was one of the Baha'i-owned institutions that was confiscated by the new Islamic government. Professor Yazdani discusses how the Baha'i community's commitment to the principle of the equality of women and men challenged prevailing societal norms and provided a living example of women's capabilities in both private and public spheres. Very early on, Baha'is started applying the principle of equality of uh, the rights of men and women in the Baha'i community both to their familial and private life and to their uh, social and administrative uh, lives. When I talk about uh, familial life, um, for example, issues pertaining to marriage, uh, to divorce, the rights that women have in it were uh, all based on the equality of men and women. And in terms of the participation of uh, women in uh, running the affairs of the community, uh, we have very interesting examples. We are talking about early 20th century when Abdul Baha uh, sends this Baha'i woman, Rohaniye Boshruyei, who is highly knowledgeable and a very good speaker. She uh, is sent by Abdul Baha to uh, Yazd, a small uh, city relatively, uh, with people who are um, kind of prejudiced at that time with regards to roles that women are allowed to play. 
and um, he, Abdul Baha, wants uh, her to uh, give talks to the Baha'i community at large, meaning men and women sit there and listen to her, which is very interesting. So not only Abdul Baha encouraged her, but also later on, when he travels to the West, he mentions her as an example of what Baha'i women can achieve in, in their services to the uh, community and society. And um, with regards to education, the principle of the oneness of humanity is basically a pivotal teaching in Baha'i education. So the Baha'i kids were taught uh, the principles of uh, equality of men and women um, to, to a degree that they, they wanted uh, to make sure that the boys are being educated and trained to care as much about this principle as the girls do because now it is a spiritual principle. So uh, it's not just about my sister, it's also about me as a boy to try to implement that uh, teaching. So with the emphasis in the Baha'i writings of uh, education, basically it is a fundamental duty of a Baha'i to educate uh, her or his uh, child. So uh, Baha'i is very active in establishing schools. Interestingly, uh, it didn't begin in a, a big city like Tehran. It started in a small village, Mahfuruzak, in Mazandaran. Uh, the mullah of uh, the village, uh, Mullah Ali John, had become a Baha'i, and he started school both for boys and uh, for girls in that uh, small village. Uh, and. Um, as you can imagine, sadly, his activities were prevented uh, by the ulama, and uh, he was uh, basically finally uh, arrested and uh, executed. But then we have a very rich history uh, of um, establishing schools all over Iran. Abdul Baha uh, encouraged Baha'is. He very closely followed uh, the establishment of schools. He wanted those schools to be of the highest uh, educational uh, level possible. And there were many things about those schools in addition to this uh, endeavor to um, upgrade them, uh, themselves in terms of education, there were other uh, points that were unique. For example, at that point, uh, we're talking about early uh, 20th century, uh, physical punishment in the schools uh, was ordinary. Baha'i schools didn't do that. No physical punishment based on the teachings of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. And then uh, co-ed schools, were almost non-existing. For some time, wherever possible, uh, there were co-ed uh, schools and then separate schools. The very uh, now famous and important uh, Baha'i school, Tarbiyat School, uh, that was formed um, in the late uh, 19th century and the best uh, possible teachers in the, uh, the community were teaching, it was open to all. And then we also had the similar schools for the girls, and then many, many, many similar schools in other uh, cities uh, of Iran. And um, as I mentioned, Abdul Baha um, was uh, basically very interested to get news from them, to guide them, and uh, to em emphasize the quality of education there. And obviously, it was not just about arts and sciences, uh, which by the way, even arts and sciences were kind of um, a, a new adoption at the beginning of these schools, because at, at the point that Baha'is started those schools, uh, Iran was mostly, uh, all that it had was traditional schools for, for the most part. Um, but but um, children, 
uh, were receiving moral, ethical education to develop upright characters. Uh, and uh, also sports, for example, uh, were promoted very seriously because, as Abdul Baha explains, physical education is part of education. Uh, and uh, I, I would like here to share an anecdote uh, that uh, I have heard from a, uh, basically a first-hand witness from uh, a woman, a Baha'i woman, who is now uh, living in um, Australia. She went to the Baha'i school in Abade, the same small town near Shiraz. And we are talking about uh, 1930s. Then what she remembers is that uh, the principal of the school, who was also a teacher, Hanum uh, Safai, she played setar, uh, a Persian musical instrument. And every morning, uh, when uh, the um, students were getting ready to go to school, she would play setar uh, at, the, at that beginning of the day. And then uh, they sang surut or, or songs with it which is, I think, remarkable given the time and the situation and the contrast between uh, what uh, the kids in that school were uh, experiencing with the larger society, I think, is uh, amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very different story. And um, it's a known fact, sad known fact, that uh, Baha'i schools uh, were closed in Iran in uh, 1934. Um, uh, part of the story is about Baha'i Baha schools closing uh, on the Baha'i holidays, uh, where work is to be suspended. And uh, apparently the government at the time uh, wanted to uh, have control over every aspect of uh, social political life. So anything that was beyond the control of the government, like um, having ho holidays for schools was not tolerated. And that led to the uh, closure of the Baha'i schools in Iran. In addition to education for the kids, there have been efforts in the Baha'i community to eradicate illiteracy uh, as much as it could. And I remember uh, that even uh, um, in the persecuted Baha'i community of Iran in 1990s, uh, the um, Baha'is were uh, trying to identify uh, the illiterate uh, in, in cities, in villages, in small towns, and provide them with education. They would have loved to provide this service for the larger community as well, uh, but uh, obviously with um, the whole Baha'i community being under so much pressure and persecution, that would have caused uh, perhaps uh, some suspicion on the part of the government. But what we could do was to eradicate illiteracy in the Baha'i community. And uh, the, the effort was impressive. I remember uh, um, just as an uh, observer, I was impressed by the time, energy, and enthusiasm that uh, the friends would uh, put into uh, educating one single person in a small town. They would send teachers, would spend time. But finally, as I remember, um, they could say that uh, illiteracy was uprooted, at least in our uh, own community. These efforts to promote material and moral education have been a constant thread throughout the history of the Baha'i community in Iran. However, in more recent decades, the community has faced a new and significant challenge, the systematic exclusion of Baha'i youth from universities. Professor Yazdani explains how the community has responded to this form of oppression with a remarkable initiative. So what I want to add to uh, this list of the services of Baha'is that they have rendered to the larger Iranian community. The best example of what we can think of as uh, constructive resilience, uh, I guess, is what Baha'is have done with regards to the education of their youth 
who are deprived from entering the universities in Iran, the formal uh, governmental uh, uh, universities. They are closed to Baha'is. They, they don't allow uh, Baha'i youth to enter them. So because of the importance of education, because education is a spiritual uh, teaching of uh, Baha'u'llah, uh, Baha'is tried to establish their own institutions of uh, higher education. And um, the Baha'i Institute of uh, Higher Education uh, is now working uh, practically as a university, helping the youth to acquire education of which they would otherwise be deprived. So they are doing this despite the fact that uh, several times over the past decades, uh, the professors, the administrators, uh, uh, have been uh, arrested, put to jail, have received years of uh, imprisonment. This is because um, they are committed to the betterment of their own and the larger society. And education is the way to go. So uh, given the importance of the uh, principle, uh, we cannot put it aside or forget it uh, or give in to the insistence of the government for closure of the BIHE. Uh, and that's how the BIHE becomes an example, a perfect example of uh, constructive resilience. We don't claim perfection, of course. We know that uh, the uh, road uh, to a much better society based on uh, Baha'u'llah's principle, the road is uh, steepy and rocky. But we do our best with a posture of humility without any claim of perfection. What we want to do is to continue to serve despite the persecution that is even now going on in Iran. You've been listening to Insights from the Field, a podcast series from the Baha'i World News Service. For more podcasts and stories, visit news.baha'i.org.